Amen. So keep your place there in Exodus chapter 32. We're going to be referencing this story throughout the sermon. So we're continuing our Egypt series. And in the Exodus chapter 32, we see the story of the, you know, the famous story of the golden calf. So I want um, especially the kids to pay attention um, this evening. This is going to be um, an important lesson for parents, um, for everybody. And I want the kids to, there's a valuable lesson here for um, children as well. But the title of the sermon in reference to Egypt tonight is the ride back, the ride back to Egypt. Going back to Egypt is the topic of tonight's sermon. If you keep your place in Exodus chapter number 32, look at, um, go to Hebrews chapter 11, if you would. Go to Hebrews chapter number 11, if you would. We're talking about going back to Egypt, and I'm going to reference Exodus chapter 32 and this story in just a few minutes. We're talking about going back to Egypt specifically for the purpose of sin, going to the world for sin, or going back to sin. The ride back is the title of the sermon. Look at Hebrews chapter 11 and verse number 24, if you would. Hebrews chapter 11 is, of course, the faith chapter in the Bible. And in verse number 24, we talk about Moses, who we see in the story here. It says, by faith, Moses, when he was come to years, in verse number 24, refused to be called the son of Pharaoh's daughter. Remember, he was raised in Pharaoh's house, Moses was, choosing rather to suffer affliction with the people of God than to enjoy, look at this, the pleasures of sin for a season, esteeming the reproach of Christ greater riches than the treasures in Egypt, for he had respect unto the recompense of the reward. Showing there that faith in Christ is how you were always saved. It was always about Christ. It was always about the Messiah. It's just people in the Old Testament were saved by looking, having faith looking forward um, to the Messiah, looking forward to the cross, as we are saved looking back at what was done for us on the cross. All right, but look, it says that Moses was not willing to, to just go to Egypt, go the easy way, and, you know, enjoy the pleasures of sin for a season. So the topic of the sermon tonight is the dangers of going to the world for sin. I want to give you a few points tonight to make you aware and tell you to beware of going to the world for sin. Christians themselves do this more than I would like to say that I've seen before. But look, a lot of people think, you know, that they can just go to the world, they can be saved, they're, saved, they're eternally secure, and they can just go temporarily um, to the world for sin. You know, I want to give you several warnings about that this evening. It never works out how you think it's going to work out. So I'm going to show you what the Bible says about that. Go to Exodus, go back to Exodus, and go to Exodus chapter number 14. You're still there in Exodus 32 with your bookmark. But the first point I want to show you tonight is, and the first thing I want to warn you about, is to beware of idols of the past. Beware of idols of the past in your life. The key thing about Egypt, the key thing about the children of Israel and about Egypt, and it applies to us directly, and one of the most dangerous characteristics about Egypt to the children of Israel is it was somewhere that they had been before. They had been there before. Look at Exodus chapter 14. Look at verse number 12. The Bible says, and this is the, the children of Israel complaining um, right after they've been taken out of Egypt. It says, is this not the word that, did we, that we did tell thee in Egypt, saying, let us alone, that we may serve the Egyptians. These are the children of Israel complaining in the wilderness. For it had been better for us to serve the Egyptians than, what we, than that we should die in the wilderness. This is when they get hungry and they get thirsty and Moses just has to deal with this complaining people. So right away we see the fact that the children of Israel had been in Egypt was a problem from the beginning. Now go back to Exodus chapter number 32. They're literally, even not even going back there to go sin, they're literally saying to Moses, we'd be better off back there. And God forbid we ever say that we'd be better off in the world than in this Christian life. But look at Exodus chapter 32. Now look, there's a lot to point out in this story, but I want to give you a couple specific things to look at tonight. Of course, this is the story of Moses goes up to um, the mountain to meet the Lord and get the, the Ten Commandments to get the law. And as he's up in the mountain for 40 days and 40 nights, the people, they, they lose faith that he's going to come back, and they have Aaron make this golden calf, and they have this big 
celebration going on. Look at verse number three. Or they have this big melee going on in ver or chapter 32 of Exodus. And all the people break off golden earrings which were in their ears and brought them unto Aaron. And he received them at their hand and fashioned it with a graving tool. After he, and after he made it a molten calf. And they said, These be thy gods, O Israel, which brought thee up out of the land of Egypt. So it didn't just pop out of the fire as a calf. He made it, right? You think you could have thought of a better one um, for that. But he made the calf. He graved it. And when Aaron saw it, he built an altar before it. You're like, what are you thinking, buddy, when you read this? And Aaron made proclamation and said, Tomorrow is the feast of the Lord. And they rose up early on the morrow and offered burnt offerings and brought peace offerings. And the people sat down to eat and to drink and rose up to play. So here's what you need to understand here. Moses is appeasing the people. The people are getting restless. Hundreds of thousands of people are getting restless, and he's appeasing the people. But now look at verse number 25. You know, it's so they rose up to play. So you're like, what's going on here? All right, look at verse number 25. Then we see this other, you know, strange detail here. And it says, when Moses saw that the people were naked, Moses is now down, and he's already, Moses is already convinced. God was so mad, God's like, I'm just starting over with you, Moses. He's literally going to wipe everybody out and just start over with Moses. But then God repented, showing again that God can change his mind, because that's all that repent means. Look at verse number 25. And he saw that the people were naked, for Aaron had made them naked unto their shame among their enemies. What's going on here? Let me just explain to you what's happening here. All right, the people are growing restless. These are, in, these are an impatient people. If you don't get anything from the Bible, you need to realize that these are impatient people. They get hungry for a couple days, they turn on their leader. They get thirsty for a day, they turn on their leader. They don't see Moses for um, uh, several weeks and they like freak out and they demand that this be done for them. Look, this is clearly some type of Egyptian festival that they knew about. This is clearly something, look, they had practice in whatever they were doing here. This was not something that they just invented in the wilderness. They, look, they're having a party. They're having a festival. They're entering into fornication. They're doing all kinds of crazy things. And Aaron, for whatever reason, for whatever lack of judgment, decided, look, I'm just going to let these people do whatever they want so maybe they don't turn on me or whatever. But the point is, no one had to teach them how to do this party, how to worship this calf, what kind of calf to make. No one had to teach this. They knew this. And this is why Egypt is so dangerous, because it did not just come out of nowhere. It was something that they already knew how to do. And this is something you need to remember about past things that you've overcome that you've been involved in in your life. Look, you will always remember those things. That's unfortunate, but it's true. You will always remember sins that you've been involved in. And look, thank God that you've gotten the victory over those things, and I'm sure many of you have. But look, while those things may seem distant to you at this point in your Christian life, especially you. And, and look, those, those cravings, if you've ever, you know, had cravings for things and you ever did things that you trained your body to like, you know, that's what I would call addiction. You know, those things will go away. But what you have to understand is those things must remain serious in your mind. You must never take those things lightly and for granted. Look at Proverbs chapter 26 on the front of your bulletin. Proverbs chapter 26 on the front of your bulletin. That's exactly what the Bible is talking about in Proverbs 26 in verse number 11, where the Bible has this very profound and direct verse where it says, as a dog that returneth to his vomit. I mean, that's gross. But that's what a dog will do. A dog will throw up and then it'll just re-eat it. It's like, ugh, gross. And you look at something like that, and you're like, oh, that's, that's, that's gross that that would happen. But it's saying, it's comparing that to someone who would go back to their sin, to someone who would go back to Egypt. So a fool returneth to his folly. Or as this sermon series covers, so a fool would return back to whatever your Egypt is, to whatever that folly or that sin or whatever. So look, the point is, the first point is this. You need to beware of those things from 
your past, Christians need to be cautious about those things that they've struggled with in the past. And I mean, look, the, I, I, cannot, I cannot emphasize this enough. Turn to Matthew chapter number 12. I cannot emphasize this first point enough because it is something that I've seen time and time again with Christians. And I'm not, I mean, look, I'm not that old. I may be older than some of you, but I'm not that old. And I have seen this time and time again. People returning to their folly. Returning to that vomit. Look, you have to understand what addiction is. Addiction is not, uh, you know, this, this medical disease. Addiction is simply something that you have trained your mind and your body to want. That's what it is. You have trained yourself a muscle memory. While you may have broken that habit or whatever it is or that desire, not taking it seriously could put you in danger of falling back into that again. And I'm not talking about just, you know, addictions. I'm talking about any kind of sin that you've overcome that you were into before, especially before you got saved. Look at Matthew chapter number 12. You, you need to be, ca be careful because even if it was something that you were trained to want, your mind wanted, your body wanted, even situations, even situations, you know, you can, you can have trained yourself for years to, do, uh, to be in sin in a certain situation, and that situation can remind you of that and make you have a desire for that. And it takes time for those things to go away. So you need to be aware of those sins and stay clear of situations, of things that could possibly bring those feelings or those temptations back. But look, your body can pick up that desire again if you head back down that road. Look at Matthew chapter 12 and look at verse number 43. And this, unfortunately, is something that I have seen several times in my life and I never want to see it again. Look at verse 43. The Bible says this. It says, When the unclean spirit has gone out of a man, he walketh through dry places, seeking rest and finding none. Then he saith, I'll return into my house from whence I came out. And when he has come, he findeth empty, swept, and garnished. Then goeth he, and taketh with himself seven other spirits more wicked than himself, and they enter in and dwell there, and the last state of that man is worse than the first. Even so shall it be unto this wicked generation. Now look, there's many applications of this verse, but one of the most simple and direct applications is this. If you fall back into past sins, you will fall back into those past sins. If you are a saved believer, and you fall back into past sins, it will be worse than it ever was for you. And this is something that is terrible to see. Christians that go back to past sins thinking, just as a soul winning tip um, from Brother Benjamin this morning, thinking that I'm just going to dip a foot in there. I'm going to have one foot in and one foot out. And they fall completely in. And look, it's worse. It's worse that time around that it's ever been in their life. Seven times worse. Look, I've seen it several times. People, people clean up. People get saved. They forsake all the, you know, all the garbage that was going on in their life. And they get saved. They get into church. They get things right. And they get moving in their Christian life. They're a soul winner. They're, they're, uh, they're three to thrive. They're doing it. And they fall back into some sin from their past. And it's seven times worse than it was before they were even saved. And you're like, how... Is that possible? Well, that's what Jesus is saying. That's what Jesus is warning about. Now, I've thought, I've seen this, and I, I always like, look, I know the Bible says it, so I believe it. But I think so many times, like, what are the mechanics of this? How does this, why does it work that way? Because, I mean, I've just, it just seems to work that way. I mean, the Bible's true. Imagine that. But let me give you an, let me give you an analogy with myself, and... It's, it, this is a very lighthearted analogy. But I'm gonna, it, I think it kind of explains. This is, this is how I think the mechanics of this works. Wednesday night, I'm trying to get back on keto so I can have a chance at this, uh, this, this competition we're doing in September. I'm trying to knock off some pounds. So I'm trying to get off of keto. It's really hard to get, once you've been off of, you know, you've been into carbohydrates. Now it's really hard to make that transition once you're on it. It's easy, but just making that transition is hard. And I was telling the kids as we came to church on, on Wednesday, I had to go to, the, to Walgreens and get an SD card. So I was running to Walgreens, and I told the kids, I was like, man, I really want some gummy bears. I mean, I, like, 
I've struck, I mean, like I'm, I'm being lighthearted here, but this, it's been an Achilles heel for me for like my whole life. Like, especially gummy bears, like those, uh, those, those ones, those Al Al Albertsons or whatever they are, the ones that are the really good ones. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> I mean, but anyway, I mean, I'm not saying that that's a sin to go and, and eat, eat, eat gummy bears. But my point is, I was going into Walgreens and I'm just, I'm thinking about this the whole, I'm driving there myself. And the kids, like, before I left the church, the kids were like, don't do it, Dad. <laughs> and so I'm driving there the whole way, and I'm just like, man, like, I'm just going to buy a bag of those things. I'll eat the whole bag before I even get back to church, and no one will even know. <laughs> <You know? laughs> but then I was just kind of, like, looking into the future, and I'm just like, you know, but then I'm just going to feel like an idiot all night long, and I'm going to feel like this weak fool. And it's like, i got to go up and preach feeling like a weak fool. Like, that's not going to work out. So, like, just the idea, just working through the whole process in my head. Like, I realized that, yeah, eating the bag of gummy bears would be good, but I realized that, like, it was going against a goal that I had, and it was something that I really shouldn't do. Look, I'm not saying it was a sin. It would have been a sin to eat the gummy bears. That's not what I'm saying. But I'm making a, a small analogy saying I wouldn't have enjoyed it. That's ultimately why I didn't do it, because I was like, I won't enjoy it anyway. What a dumb decision to make. And I think... That's at least partially why people that go back into sins from the past get so deep into those past sins. Because I think they get into those sins and they just they dip a foot in and all they do is, I don't care if it's drinking or it's drugs or whatever it is, or you know, any kind of sin that they were into in the past, but they realize like, I'm not really like, their conscience is just killing them. Because they're saved, the Holy Spirit's with them. They're, they're just grieving the Holy Spirit the whole time. So they gotta just, they gotta go crazy and just silence that Holy Spirit. They gotta go overboard to just shut down that Holy Spirit that is yelling at them. I mean, the gummy bears was a tiny little small analogy of what I'm trying to show you, but that's why I think that it works. Like it works this way because that's what God said. But that's what I think the mechanics of it are. That's why you see these people, they, they backslide and they go back into these sins. I don't think that they meant to go back that far into those sins. I don't think one person that I've seen this happen to meant for it to go back that far. I think if one person, every single person that I know that this has happened to, could see how far they would have been into it before they made the first step to go into it, they never would have went back. They never would have taken that ride back to Egypt. But look, it is terrible. But because the Holy Spirit is grieving them, they just push harder and harder and harder to just, you know, take the flesh over the top of the Spirit. So look, that leads to my second point. That leads to my second point. Turn to Romans chapter 6. The second point is this. You can think that you're going to take a ride back to Egypt and you're just going to go there and dip one toe into Egypt, go back just a little bit into that sin, but Egypt will trap you there. This is the problem. The ride back is easy to Egypt. The ride back, especially if you've been to Egypt, the ride back is a little too easy. That's why the children of Israel just kept saying, like, we just go back there. Why don't we just go back there? Because to them, the ride back there was easy. It was something that they knew. To worship this calf for them was easy. In a couple of weeks, let's just have that party that we used to always have in Egypt. That's what we need. It was easy for them to do it. Egypt, though, point number two is Egypt will trap you. Look at Romans chapter 6. Romans chapter 6, the Bible says in verse number 9, it says, knowing, look, the Bible says that you could become a servant to sin even after you are saved. Look at this. Knowing that Christ being raised from the dead dieth no more, death hath no more dominion over him. There's a really important comparison here. Verse number 9 and verse number 10 are talking about Jesus, and then verse number 11 and verse number 12 are talking about you. Okay, so let's pay attention here. Knowing that Christ being raised from the dead dieth no more, death hath no more dominion over him. For in that he died, he died unto sin once, but in that he liveth, he liveth unto God. So it's talking about how death does not, Jesus is not a servant to death. Why? Because he rose from the dead. You say, why the resurrection? That's why. Because Jesus needed to prove that death had no dominion over him. Likewise, now it's giving a comparison here. Reckon ye also yourselves to be dead unto sin, but alive unto God through Jesus Christ our Lord. You know what the Bible here is saying? It's saying, kill your flesh. Don't, don't shut the spirit down. Kill the flesh. 
is what the Bible is saying. Let not therefore sin reign in your mortal body. Look, are these people saved or are these people not saved? He's talking to saved people here. He's saying, don't let sin reign in your mortal body, that you should obey it in the lust thereof. He's saying, look, this is why past sins are so dangerous, because your body is trained to do them easily. Because your mind is trained to like them. Muscle memory works both good and bad. You have to remember that. Look at verse number 13. Neither yield your members as instruments of unrighteousness. Notice that word yield. What does that mean? That means you are giving up. That means you are turning over your strength. If you yield in a fight, you're say you're, you're voluntarily, this is like, you know, UFC, the guy that taps out. He's like, I yield. He's like, I don't want, look, he's not dead. He's, he's like, I don't want my arm broken. I don't want to go unconscious. So he what? He yields. He, he voluntarily gives up to avoid greater damage. But here we're talking about yielding our members, yielding our body to instruments of unrighteousness. Sin. Look at verse 14. For sin shall not have dominion over you. Look, sin should not have any more dominion over you than death had over Christ. Did death have dominion over Jesus? No, it didn't. So why does sin have dominion over you? That's, what the, that's the comparison the Bible is using here. What then? Shall we sin? Because we are not under the law, but under grace? God forbid. This is, that, this is the answer for you know, the Catholic or people that believe in works-based salvation, saying, you can't tell people salvation is free. First of all, yes, we can, because that's what the Bible says. So whatever you think, it doesn't matter, because the Bible says it. But second of all, it doesn't mean we should just go out and sin. God forbid. Know ye not that whom ye yield yourselves servants to obey, his servants ye are to whom ye obey, whether of sin unto death or of obedience unto righteousness. The Bible's saying you have a choice here. You have a choice here. You can choose to be free by following the Spirit, or you can choose to be enslaved. You can choose to be a servant to sin. Now let me ask you a question. A Christian who voluntarily, knowingly sins, is, you know, dis knowingly disobeys the Spirit, disobeys the Word of God, is willingly putting themselves in servitude. So let me ask you a question. Does somebody in servitude just get to randomly say, like, I'm, I'm, I'm done, I'm leaving? Somebody that puts themselves in servitude is underneath the authority of whatever it is they're in servitude to. And look, People think that they're just going to drop into sin and they're just going to pop right back out. But the problem is that sin wraps chains of servitude around them. And they're not strong enough to break those chains. And get, look, it's possible to break those chains and get back. But they fall into sin. They fall into that sin deeper than they ever have. And those chains are around them. They voluntarily put themselves there, though. That's what the Bible is telling us. Because sin ultimately... Ultimately, sin, even for that person that went back deeper into sin, deeper into Egypt than they were in the past, sin has no more power to keep them there than death has to keep Jesus in the grave. But for some reason, people get stuck there. People get trapped back in Egypt. So they go and they, they want to put one foot back in, and they get the whole body pulled back in, and they get trapped back there. So that's the second thing. Egypt will trap you there. It will keep you. The third point is this. Sin, going back to Egypt, will cost you. Sin will cost you a price. See, people heading to Egypt for a season, they're just going to dip their foot in. They always forget this, or at least, and I'm going to tell you how I think this works too, or they at least severely underestimate this one. They underestimate the price of sin. Hebrews chapter 12. Turn to Hebrews chapter number 12, if you would. Hebrews chapter number 12, you're still keeping your place in the uh, Exodus chapter number 32. Exodus chapter number 32, you're keeping your place, and you're going to Hebrews chapter number 12. See, with the Christian, and I, I've explained this several times to people who get saved that I know that are in sin. I just gave the gospel to somebody uh, a week ago, and I explained this um, to um, this person. As a Christian, as someone who's saved, there's no getting away with it. 
Look at Hebrews chapter number 12 and verse number 6. Once you're adopted into this family, there is no getting away with it. There is no God's not going to see. Look at verse number 6. For whom the Lord loveth, he chasteneth, and scourgeth every son, that's you if you're saved, whom he receiveth. If ye endure chastening, God dealeth with you as sons. For what son is he whom the Father chasteneth not? That's saying, like, if you're not getting chastened, um, there, that's weird. But if ye be without chastisement, whereof all are partakers, then you're bastards and not sons. But if you're saved, there is no getting away with it. There is going to be a price. Now go back to Exodus chapter number 32. And a lot of people will say this. A lot of people that take that ride back to Egypt, they say, yeah, I know there's going to be a price, but I'm willing to pay that. I know there's going to be consequences, but, you know, I'm willing to deal with the consequences. I just really want to go back to Egypt for a little bit, and I'll just take the, uh, I'll take the lashings um, as they come. But the problem is this. You can't afford the price. You don't see the price coming, and it's something that you can't afford. And I'm going to explain to you why that is in just a minute. But look at Exodus chapter number 32 and verse number 20. We see that example in this um, story here. In verse number 20, it says what Moses did at first, and he took the calf which they made and burnt it in the fire and ground it into powder, strawed it upon the water, and made the children of Israel drink it. You're like, man, that's rough. He ground it up. Made them, he's, like, he's like, drink it if you like it so much. You're like, man, that's bad. But that's not really anything compared to what actually happened. Look at verse number 27. <clears throat> he said unto them, Thus saith the Lord God of Israel, Put every man his sword by his side, go in and out from, the gate, from gate to gate throughout the camp, and slay every man his brother, and every man his companion, and every man his neighbor. So Moses says, Moses basically says right before this verse, he's like, hey, who's on the Lord's side? He's like, who, he's, you know what he's trying to figure out? He's trying to figure out who has godly sorrow. He's trying to figure out who's really sorry, who's really, uh, you know, upset, who's, you know, vengeful and vehe has vehement desire that they did something wrong and just wants to get things right. And he asked that question and whoever came, he's like, all right, now go down there and slay the people that you were just partying with. And look at verse number 28. And the children of Levi did according to the word of Moses, and there fell of the people that day about 3,000 men. And several more thousand died in a plague um, right after this. But the point is this. The decision. I wonder how many people would have made the decision to go to that party if they knew they would die. If they knew that the price would be their life. See, they think they can have fun for a season. And then come back. And deal with some minor consequences. But they're never ready for the actual consequences that come. Now just think about this for a second. Think about God as our Heavenly Father. Why would God ever chastise you as a Christian? You go back to Egypt. You get back into sin. You willingly go back into something. Look, and, and willfully sinning is much worse than sinning when you don't know you're sinning. So willfully going back to something you know is wrong, going back there, why would God chastise you with something that you didn't think is serious? That would make no sense. I mean, it's not like, see, people see sin in front of them, and they go back to Egypt, and they say, yeah, I'll just, I'll just get grounded for a week, and I'll just, I'll just do the time, no problem. Or they say, yeah, God's just going to put me in time out. And it's not going to be a big deal. But here, here's the thing. God doesn't do time out. God hasn't read Dr. Spock. God is going to chastise you with something that gets you right. He's going to chastise you with something that gets you to think about ever going back there again. Why? Because God wants you corrected. He wants you back in the Christian life. I mean, he's not going to, he's going to chastise you with something that you never saw coming. This is another thing that I've seen several times. He's going he's to chastise you with something that deters you. Or, or if you're a complete lost cause and you're going to remain backslidden, he is going to chastise you with something that deters everyone that looks at you. where people will look at you and they will fear the chastisement 
of God. Look, I mean, this, this just shows that, like, someone that thinks that they're prepared for consequences, they have no idea what's coming. And I'm going to give you two categories of these consequences that people don't see coming. This is not an all-inclusive list, but these are the main ones that I have seen. The first one is this. The most common one is this. Turn to Jeremiah chapter number 32. The first one, and this is not the worst one. This is not the worst one, but the first one that I have seen, a consequence of going back to Egypt, a price that we're talking about, we're talking about prices that people thought they could pay that they would never want to pay if they knew what the cost actually was. The first one is this, generational consequences of their hypocrisy. That's the first one. And this is not the worst, but it's a bad one. Look at Jeremiah chapter number 32. Here's what you need to realize, and I've seen this one so many times, but here's what you need to realize. Our children will adopt our idols. I want you to look at this very, I want, I want you to turn to Jeremiah 32, and then I want you to keep your place there, and I want you to flip to Ezekiel chapter 18, and I want to compare these two verses, because I think that a lot of people are confused about this part in the Bible, and I want to make sure that I lay this out clear for you tonight, because a lot of people will look at this and they'll be like, oh, there's a Bible contradiction there. The Bible's saying two different things. But I want to show you tonight that there are generational consequences of living a hypocritical Christian life, of saying one thing to your children and then going back to Egypt yourself is what you actually do. Look at Jeremiah chapter 32. You've got your finger in Ezekiel chapter 18. Look at verse 17. It says, Ah, Lord God, behold, thou hast made heaven and earth by thy great power and stretched out arm, and there is nothing too hard for thee. Thou showest, verse 18, thou showest loving kindness unto thousands and recompensest the iniquity of the fathers into the bosom of their children after them. The great, the mighty God, the Lord of hosts is his name. You see that? It says it recomp he recompenses the iniquity of the fathers into the bosom of their children. Now go to Ezekiel chapter 18, keeping your place in Jeremiah chapter 32, and look at verse number 20. The Bible says, The soul that sinneth, in Ezekiel 18, 20, it shall die. The son shall not bear the iniquity of the father. Neither shall the father bear the iniquity of the son. The righteousness of the righteous shall be upon him, and the wickedness of the wicked shall be upon him. You're like, what in the world? What's that all about? What's he talking about there? Go back to Jeremiah chapter 32. Go back to Jeremiah chapter number 32, and look at verse number 18 again. And look what it actually says. So in Ezekiel chapter 18 and verse number 20, it says, The iniquity of the father, the son shall not be punished for the iniquity of the father of the father. But what does Jeremiah 32, 18 says? It says, he, he recompenseth the iniquity of the fathers, meaning he punishes the iniquity of the fathers into the bosom of their children after them. It doesn't say they pay for their iniquity. He says he puts the iniquity of the fathers into the bosom. You remember Hosea 2, 2? Where was the unfaithfulness in the adulterous woman? It was between her breasts. You know what that is? The bosom. You know what that is? That's where your heart is. This is talking about the children adopting the sin of their fathers into their hearts. And then when they commit those sins, then they're punished for their own sins. That is the danger of going back to Egypt, is that you will take your iniquity and you will plant it into the hearts of your children. And that is a terrible, terrible thing. Great in counsel, verse number 19 of Jeremiah 32. Great in counsel and in mighty work. For thine eyes are open upon all the ways of the sons of men to give everyone according to his ways and according to the what? The fruit of his doings. Look, Ezekiel chapter 18 and verse number 20 says, if your dad kills somebody, you're not going to be punished for that civil crime. But what Jeremiah 32 is explaining is that if your dad is into, and I mean, isn't this what we see 90% of the time? If your dad is into some certain sin, if your dad is a drunk, what happens with the kids? Most of the time, they're drunks. Yes, yeah, sometimes they reject it, and that's great that that happens. You know, the, 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 the word of the Lord intercedes, something intercedes there, and they reject it. But... Jeremiah 32 is talking about children that are adopting the sins in their hearts 
of the father, and then when they grow up, they end up doing those same sins. Then they're punished for them by the sins that they did. But they were planted in their heart by their fathers. Now, it's an interesting, in Ezekiel chapter uh, number 18, if you go back to verse number 14, it's interesting, if you go back to verse number 14, let me flip over there real quick uh, myself. If you go to Ezekiel chapter number, um, go back to verse number uh, chapter 18, and look back at verse 14, this is a unique situation here. It's kind of a, a cool situation where it says, in verse number 14, Now, lo, if you beget a son, see, because... Ezekiel, remember, Ezekiel chapter 18 is talking about how the son won't be punished for the sins of the father. Jeremiah 32 is talking about the iniquity of the father being planted into the hearts of the children. All right? But look at verse 14. It says, Now, lo, if he beget a son, and seeth all his father's sins, which he hath done, and considereth and doeth not such like. So guess what? There is hope. That he'd not eaten up the mountains, neither hath lifted up his eyes to the idols of the house of Israel, nor hath defiled his neighbor's wife, neither hath oppressed any, hath not withholden the pledge, neither hath spoiled by violence, but hath given his bread to the hungry, and hath covered the naked with a garment, that had taken off his hand from the poor, that had not received usury nor increase, hath executed my judgments, and walked in my statutes. He shall not die for the iniquity of the Father. He shall surely live. So, newsflash, Ezekiel 18 is saying exactly the same thing, is Jeremiah chapter 32. Right. So don't let people, that's all that to say this, don't let people point out that, oh, contradiction in the Bible. It's like, hey, why don't you try reading a couple verses before and a couple verses after. Get saved so you can understand what it actually says first and then read the Bible, all right? So look, the point is, is sins are adopted. This is a price. This is a price. Our children, back to the point, our children will adopt our idols. That's what the Bible is warning us here. And look, that's a huge price to pay. That is a massive price to pay. One of the things that we are trying to do with our children by homeschooling our children and teaching them the Bible and all this, especially people that got saved later in life, is, hey, I don't want my kids to have those temptations. I don't want my kids to have those desires. Because guess what? If they'd never been to Egypt, Egypt is like zero temptation to them. If they've never been there in the first place, it's a joke. They see people going back there. They're like, what are they doing back there? Bunch of morons. Running around naked, worshiping a calf? What are you crazy? That's what they look, that's how they look at it. Why? Because they've never been there. And that's what we want. That's what we want for the children. That's what we want for the kids. Because no person, no person unless they've been there and they've been trained to be there, would ever choose that. Let me let me use the family integrated church tonight. Kids. Raise your hand, just kids, are y'all listening? Raise your hand if you want to be a bum when you grow up. Where are the hands? Nobody would choose that. Nobody would choose that. So why? Because they've never been there. They've never been. And look, no child ever, dad, I want to be a bum when I grow up, said no son ever to his father. But yet that's what happens when they go into alcohol and drugs and go down these roads, and pretty soon, there they are. And they, they just can't get out of Egypt. They can't get out. They're not strong enough. All right? Go back to Romans chapter 6, if you would. But here's what I think is the biggest price to pay. Here's what I think is the biggest miss for people that think they're going to go dip a toe back in Egypt, just dip a foot back in the waters. Look at Romans chapter 6. And look at verse number 22. You see, your sins, so look, that's a pretty, look, generational consequences, planting iniquity into the hearts of your children, that's a pretty big consequence. I think if people thought that through and thought about going back into Egypt, like, oh, my kids are going to see this, and I'm going to plant this iniquity in their hearts, and this is going to cost them throughout their whole life. I think people would think twice about that. As they go back to Egypt, it's seven times worse for them. And I think that's also, you know, by the way, just my observation, I think that that methodology of going back to Egypt and having it become seven times worse, I think that that same methodology follows through generationally. And the reason is, is because I don't know how many times I have to see that some father had a sin or some mother had a sin and that child, it's way worse for them. They get into and they adopt that sin, except they adopt it in a more extreme manner. 
than the, the father did because it was planted in their heart, in their bosom early. And it grew. Look at Romans chapter 6 and verse number 22. So look, that's a bad consequence. And that's a consequence that people would, if people say, I'm going to go back to Egypt and I'll, I'll pay the consequence, if they knew that that was a consequence, they would never go because they would never want to pay that. I've never met anybody, saved or unsaved, at the door that tells me that they don't want their kids. I've never, let me to rephrase this. I've never met anybody after they got saved that told me that they didn't want their kids to get saved too. Because people care more about their kids than they do about themselves. Like, like that's a normal, that's a normal, natural instinct to care more about your children than you do about yourself. But look at Romans chapter 6 and verse number 22. There's a consequence that's worse. You say, how could it be worse than that? But now being made, notice how we're kind of on the same topic here. It says, now being made free from sin. So this is how stupid it would be to enchain, to chain yourself into Egypt when you're free from it. It's like, it's like you think you're a slave and you're not. You could just get up and walk away. But now being made free from sin and become servants to God, ye have your fruit unto holiness and the end everlasting life. So look, yes, at the end you have everlasting life. But what is before that when you serve God? You have fruit. And here's what people miss. They read this word fruit. All the time in the Bible, fruit and be fruitful and fruitfulness and all this and the, you know, the parable of the sower and all, all these things. We just, we hear this word fruit so much in the Bible that I almost think sometimes we forget that fruit is people's souls. That's what it's talking about. So if you go and you chain yourself up in Egypt, you don't have fruit unto holiness. You still have righteousness and, and the, the, you still have the end everlasting life. But you don't have that fruit unto holiness. Look, we're talking about just because, we're talking about the fact that heading to Egypt, even for a little bit, could cost other people their souls. Something else that was brought up in this, going and being worldly could cost people their eternal salvation. What could be more serious than that? I mean, other people's souls. I think, you know, I think we need to take our, our Christian lives more seriously when we realize that that's what's on the line. I mean, our works have nothing to do with whether we personally go to heaven, but our works and following the Spirit instead of the flesh has everything to do with whether other people get to hear the gospel and get a chance to receive that same gift that you received when you didn't deserve it. The main point tonight, folks, is this. I mean, if you, if, you, if you go back, don't be surprised. If you go back to Egypt and you hang out in Egypt, number one, don't be surprised when your children become Egyptians. That's a high price to pay. And the funny thing is, is the ride back to Egypt for people that have been there, and this is why you see it with the, with the Old Testament, in the Old Testament with the nation of Israel and the children of Israel, the ride back to Egypt, especially in people's minds, is incredibly easy because people know the way. People know the way. People remember it. People have, even sometimes, people have fond memories of it. And that's another thing. That's a first warning. That's another reason that 1 Corinthians, uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 7 is so important when we talked about godly sorrow. When it, you, you saw those words like, Revenge, vehement desire. What I mean, just those those serious words like revenge against what? Revenge against Egypt. If you find yourself looking back to Egypt, even in your mind and memory, and you know, remembering Egypt, and you start getting like good feelings about it and, and good memories about it, you, like you need to check where you're at in your life, because. It's actually pretty easy to get back there. But the problem is, is that the tickets back and the price for them are too expensive. That's the problem. The way back is simple. The way back is easy to Egypt. But it's coming back here 
that people struggle with. And that, that's what I've seen time and time again. I mean, just, it's easy to see when people are backslidden. It's easy to see when people are getting out of church. It's easy to see when people are, you know, stopping soul winning and stopping serving God in their life. But I always pray when that happens that they're not actually taking that ride back to Egypt into something, into some place in Egypt that they've been before. Because I know that if they go back there, it's going to be very difficult to get them coming the other way. So it's best to just see these warning signs and realize that no, there, there is no dipping one foot in. That's not how it works. That's not how God works, and that's not how, that's not how Satan works. Satan's going to grab the whole leg, and he's going to grab your whole family. He's going to turn everybody into an Egyptian. So be careful. Be careful looking back. That's why Jesus said, don't look back. Look in front of you. Confess it. Move on. Look in front of you. And don't look back there at all. Let's bow our heads and have a word of prayer.